Well, welcome back to the show, guys. You are watching and listening to Deep Dive for Life, the show where we take a deep dive into Scripture each week. But we're going to look into the question of what if Jesus was really here? Um, Matthew 1 tells us, because it's Christmas season, um, that Jesus was to be given the name Emmanuel, which means God with us, yes. not us without God or however we think it actually is, because it may be one of those things where we feel like he's not here because it's out of sight, out of mind. And so we forget that Jesus is really here with us. But in terms of, as Christians, us realizing that Jesus really is here, I mean, it could change our entire outlook on worship, our entire outlook on the relationship that we have with God. And so that is where we're going to sit today. And you're right, it does tie in beautifully with the Christmas message. Uh, it's the idea that God is with us, that God is present with us, physically or otherwise. Um, God is with his people. And, um, you know, God left the glory and splendor of heaven, took on human form, born as a helpless baby, uh, lived here on earth, performed miracles, ascended into heaven. But then as you keep reading the New Testament, Jesus appears beside Paul to encourage him. Um, he meets with Paul on the Emmaus Road. Um, you get to the book of Revelation, and our first vision of Jesus is that he is standing amongst his churches. Mm -hmm. They're pictured in Revelation as lampstands, but he's walking amongst the churches. And um, as you read chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, he knows exactly what's happening in every church. He's intimately acquainted with it. Um, and even the, the perspective in the New Testament, you know, when, when he confronts the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road, he doesn't say, why are you persecuting my people? Mm -hmm. He says, why are you persecuting me? Mm -hmm. uh, so Jesus is um, personally involved with his church. And that only makes sense. Um, the scriptures tell us that Christ loved the church. He gave his life for his church. He started the church. Of all the things Jesus could have done, he established the church. Um, in Ephesians, we learn that Jesus is washing his church. Uh, through the power of, of the Spirit and the Word. Uh, he's preparing his church just as a bride prepares for her wedding, mm. uh, that one day his church will be presented to him as a radiant bride. Um, and so Revelation announces the wedding feast of the Lamb, um, the, the, the time when the church and Christ come together that way. So, so Jesus loved the church, established the church, is preparing the church, and is coming again mm -hmm. for his church. So... Um, Jesus is intimately involved with his people. And so he says things like, where two or three are gathered, there I am in your midst. Or go and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. Mm -hmm. And I'm also with you always. I am with you all the time. So I, I think you're right. Our perspective would change if we would be aware of Christ's presence. So. What's the difference between Christ being with us and, say, Santa Claus? You think he sees you when you're sleeping, oh, no. sees you when you're awake, he yeah. knows if you've been bad or good. So what, what's the differentiating factor here? Oh, man. Yeah, when you, when you really think about the lyrics to that song, Santa Claus sounds pretty creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want somebody watching me sleep. Well, let's address that for a minute because God knows our hearts. Mm. I mean, he knows our motives. He mm. knows why we do what we do. Nothing is hidden from God, the mm. Scripture teaches us. And that is both a comfort and a warning at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is comforting to know that somebody understands, that somebody knows. Um, you know, there's the old spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, so so there's great comfort in the fact that that our intentions and our motives are known by God. He knows our pain. He feels our pain more deeply than we do. He understands. There's a, a, a context and a perspective there. So the fact that God knows us intimately um, is, is an incredible comfort. But it's also a warning because there are some things in our lives that we would prefer no one see, mm. much less God. Mm -hmm. And, and I think we fool ourselves into thinking that God doesn't know or God doesn't see or God isn't aware. Um, 
I think that's part of why we may behave one way at church on Sunday and a different way at work on Monday, mm -hmm. for example. You know, we, we compartmentalize, mm -hmm. but God made everything. Everything is sacred in a sense because it all relates to God. It's all part of his creation. But what you're saying is that our mindset would change if we saw Jesus sitting on the front row of church Sunday morning. I think we would. Um, I think it would change. I think we would immediately be aware of our sin. I think we would immediately uh, worship from the depths of our being. Mm. And unfortunately, we don't worship from the depths of our being. Mm. We go through the motions. We stand when we're supposed to stand, and we sit when we're supposed to sit, and we bow our heads when we're supposed to bow our heads. But we have lost a sense of awe of God, and we've lost a sense of... Um, the radiating glory of God. Back to the Christmas story, you know, the the the, the angel appears to the shepherds, and um, and that's pretty cool because you know an angel, and he has good news, great joy for all people. Yeah. But it also says that the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Now that's a, you know, a difficult thing for our minds to even grasp what that would look like. Mm -hmm. But we have lost that in our worship at times. We don't. We don't feel or see the glory of the Lord coming around us in worship. And I think we would um, in, in, if, if Christ were physically present in the room. So do you see this more as a call of action with modern-day Christians, that we should be acting in a way where yes, Jesus is in the room? because Jesus is in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to worship as if Jesus is in the room, and we need to serve as if Jesus is serving beside us. We need to, because he is. I mean, it's not an if, as if I've I've used that that phrase, but but he truly is with us. He's with us when we worship. He's with us when we pray. He's with us when we hurt. And and part of an active prayer life is acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a ongoing conversation with God all through the day, and regardless of the circumstance. Um, and I think God uses times even when we may feel lonely or may feel um, set apart um, because no Christian is ever truly alone. Hmm. I mean, we, we, we have um, the best company with us at all times. And so to, to, to live by faith and not by sight um, is a pretty important thing. So how do we get to that point then? How do we... You'd, you'd already mentioned a good prayer life, right? Building that relationship, yes. And I guess we should start there, yes, um, because that could be the biggest change in a lot of people's lives, okay? Or could lead to the biggest change, could lead to the biggest long-term change, right? If you tell someone that they need to start giving on Sunday mornings, they may do it for a week or two, and then eventually fall off. We see that every year with um, like New Year's resolutions and sure. such, but. Prayer can be an easier entry point for some people. Okay, so let's start there. Let's say, I mean, we'd already done, we've already done a little bit of a good in depth study on prayer, a good conversation on prayer, right? But how do we change our prayer life to achieve that sense of awe that should be present? Yeah, because awe is necessary, but also intimacy. Mm. I mean, realizing that, that that Christ already knows our hearts, that and that He is with us, and that He feels our pain more deeply than we do. So, so it's a it's a it's a fascinating combination. Uh, we talked about the Lord's Prayer already, but but you know Jesus in that opening statement, "Our Father," you know, that's a close, personal, intimate Abba, yeah, yeah, term, um, which are in heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so you've got you've got both of those in that one little sentence. Um, where, where we are in awe of God and his glory and splendor, and at the same time, there is an intimacy and a warmth and a glory and a glow that comes from being in the very presence of God. Um, but being in the presence of God transforms every situation. Mm -hmm. So no longer is waiting in the grocery store line a hassle because we're in the midst of God's presence, mm -hmm. and he's going to create opportunities for us to reflect his glory and his love and his light. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think not only prayer is important there, but also just an intentionality and a realization that we are put here. We were created to bring glory and honor to God um, and to enjoy him. Um, 
you know, students don't want to fail a course. We don't want to receive a failing grade in life. I, mean, mm. I don't guess they give those necessarily. Depends but on how you look at it. But <laughs> if you fail at the purpose for which you were created, mm. that's a huge failure. Mm-hmm. And I think we have convinced ourselves that we're here to please ourselves or to be comfortable or to get what we want or to have have it our way. Mm-hmm. When in fact we're here to enjoy God and to and to be part of glorifying Him through through the gifts that He's entrusted to us. So there's an intentionality behind realizing that Jesus is present too, that that can change our attitude, change our perspective, change our 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 everything. And and Christmas is a perfect time to dive into that mm-hmm. um, because Chris, the message of Christmas is that God is with us. He is Emmanuel. Um, he is not distant away in the heavens. He is right here with us. And he chose to enter not only the darkness of our world, but the darkness of our hearts. Yeah. I have recently started watching The Crown on Netflix. Okay. I would recommend it. It's a great show. Um, yeah. At least I really like it. But there's one of these moments before Elizabeth becomes queen, when she's still princess, she's out on tour um, to all of their commonwealths. I don't don't know what the exact term is. Um, All their provinces, providences, that type of thing. Um, When her father dies while she's out on this tour, and suddenly... Everyone's attitude around her changed once they realized, oh, hold up. That's the queen now. Right. And just like the whole, and I think they did this on purpose, but like the, the music changes, the everyone's facial expressions around her changes, and there's just this like, whoa, hold up. This is the queen that now. Mm. And I feel like, we would have the same reaction. Oh, yeah. But more so. Mm. I mean, there's a, a bit of a difference between the Queen of England and the creator of the universe. Yes. <laughs> and and God is the most powerful, the most interesting, the most loving, the most appealing being in the universe. Mm. I mean, we, we our concept of God is so limited, but, but God is above and beyond anything we can imagine. Um. Joni Erickson Tata used to talk about, and when she would talk about heaven, she would mention um, the four living creatures that surround God's throne. And um, I've I've used this a number of times in in sermons, but, um, you know, the four living creatures constantly say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Mm -hmm. Um, And that sounds like kind of a dull job for all eternity, but it really isn't. They're standing in the midst of God's presence and what if every time they look, they see something of God that they have never seen before, mm-hmm. but that just leads them to awe and worship, and they cry out in, in wonder, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then before they can get that out of their breath, they see something else about God that just makes them be in utter awe and amazement. And that goes on for all eternity. Mm-hmm. They never run out of things that are amazing about God. And that's a much truer picture, I think. Um, so in, in God's presence, um, whew, um, worship will not be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so why, if God, if being in God's presence really does change your outlook, why doesn't it change it here? Hmm. Why doesn't it change our outlook here on earth? Because God is with us. Yeah. I mean, God is here. Just maybe we don't see him for instance the four creatures yes. in heaven yes who are looking upon right right god right i mean they get to see yes all of these wonderful things and then right. cry out holy 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 right whereas we have faith mm. you know it's not sight it's faith um that we have a god who keeps his promises that we have a god who's glorious um but I think part there, there are a lot of answers to that question. Mm. Um, I think one of the things that keeps us from wrapping our, well, there are several things that keep our, us from wrapping our minds around the glory yes. of God. 
Uh, one is God is so much bigger than we are that our tiny minds can't comprehend. Mm -hmm. So that that's part of it. And, you know, I have a fish at home and I talk to the fish and I can tell the fish my problems. And the fish seems kind of empathetic, but, you know, his level of understanding is going to be a little different because he's fish. Mm -hmm. um, in a much, much bigger way, you know, God is beyond our ability to comprehend mm -hmm. uh, on so many different levels. He's beyond time. He's beyond space. We we can't even grasp what the Trinity is about, how there can be one God and three persons, or, or the incarnation, how Jesus can be 100% God and 100% man at the same time. I mean, that's, even Woodruff math can't make that work. Yeah. You know? so, <laughs> um, so there's just a lot of things that are above and beyond us, and that's, and that's part of why we have trouble with that. But I think a bigger thing is the sin in our lives, mm. um, and we're attached to it, mm -hmm. and we hold on to it. And it becomes a higher priority to us than God does. Hmm. Um, and I think we are often looking for an emotional experience um, for, you know, for us to feel God's presence the way we might feel um, love for somebody in a romantic sense on the yeah. first date, that yeah. kind of thing. We're mm -hmm. looking, we're, and, and, and that happens, mm -hmm. but that's not all our relationship with God's about. Um, faith is, is knowing that God is present even when we don't feel that presence, you know, in, in the midst of the darkness to know that there's still light. So do you feel like having that emotional connection is important, though? It is. It's very important. But it can't be the only part of our relationship with God. Mm. Um, and we can't live on the mountaintop. There are valleys. Yes. And, and a lot of our faith gets strengthened and cultivated in the valley. Mm -hmm. in the midst of the questions, in the midst of the difficulties that we face. And we need both. We need the mountains and the valleys. Uh, we need those experiences where we really feel God's presence in, powerful, in a powerful and, and transforming way. But we also need those times when, when we are um, growing in our faith in the valley. Um, one expression that you hear sometimes is that the teacher is always silent during the test. Um, hmm. You know, when we're going through difficulties and troubles, sometimes it's an exercise where God gives us the room for our faith to grow. I and mean, we see that in like the story of Job, for example. Uh, in Job's story, God does come and he reveals himself and his presence causes all of Job's questions to go out the window, mm -hmm. you know, because God's presence is more powerful than any of the questions Job had. Um, but God doesn't appear early in the, in the story. Yeah. It's yeah. at the end. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of struggle that takes place in the story of Job before God appears. Looking into looking into some of the ways that God is with us. Yes. I mean, although we don't see him, although we don't hear him in mm -hmm. some ways, like, I mean, I guess I wouldn't hear him in like our conversation now, for instance. I, I probably won't hear him in that way, right. at least in my experience, I haven't. Right. Not saying that he can't. Right. Because, I mean, duh. <laughs> yeah. He can do anything he wants. Right. Um, but if if he is looking to have that type of relationship with people, why do you think he doesn't do that? Well, I think he's constantly reaching out to us. I think we get distracted. I think the sin in our lives keeps us from hearing. I think we aren't paying attention. Mm. Um, going back to the Christmas story, you know, um, God warns Joseph in a dream um, not to remain in Bethlehem, to, to, to pack up his family and, and flee. Uh, one theologian suggested, and, and who knows, but what if God warned everybody in Bethlehem in a dream? Huh. But Joseph is paying attention. Mm -hmm. Joseph is listening. Joseph is willing to be obedient. Joseph is willing to do what it takes to, to, to hear God's voice and move. I know in my own life, there have been times where I did not hear an audible voice, but I know it was God speaking. Yeah, um, I was walking one way and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, I needed to turn around and go back. Mm -hmm. And when I've been obedient in those situations, incredible things have happened. I've been doing a little bit of a dive into discernment myself. We, we, we talked about um, the King's recently in our walking through the Bible studies and of how Solomon 
prayed for discernment. He yes. prayed for wisdom and how God granted him that yes. wisdom and how that should show us that whenever we do pray for discernment and wisdom, he gives it to us and he would grant it. But then we have to have faith that he gave us the discernment to make the decisions. Right. And and it's wrapped up in a daily dependence mm -hmm. on God. Um, you know, that whole idea of knowing what's right and wrong, that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. You remember the tree was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And when Adam and Eve sinned, basically what they were doing was they were saying, God, you've said what's right and wrong, but we're going to make this up on our own. Uh, we don't trust you. We don't trust what you've said is right and wrong. We believe it's in our best interest to take this fruit mm -hmm. and eat it. We're going to define good and evil for ourselves. Mm. And that's a pattern that goes all the way through Scripture. Uh, we get to the time of the Judges, and through the book of Judges, I don't know what movie rating you would give it. It's not G. It's not PG-13. It's not NC-17. It would be yes, we're in the X's now. MA or yeah. X or... Yeah. Because horrible things take place in the mm -hmm. book of Judges. And people scratch their heads and think, why are those stories in the Bible? They're, they're, they're absolutely horrific. But they're there to show us what happens when we define good and evil for ourselves. Yeah, uh, Because over and over in Judges, it says people did what was right in their own eyes. And on one level, that looks like, oh, they're doing what's right. But no, it's talking about how they define good and evil for themselves. And the results are horrific. And unfortunately, that's the nature of our society. Uh, we have abandoned what God says is right and wrong, and we're making it up as we go along, and things are crumbling. If only we remember that God is with us. Yes. He is here. I mean, he's watching us yes. crumble. <laughs> well, and he is willing to help us to discern. Mm -hmm. He is willing to help us to know what is right and what is wrong. And, and in the midst of any temptation, if we will stop and pray, for wisdom, for that discernment, God will hear our prayer and will answer that prayer. Mm -hmm. um, he always gives us a way out of temptation. We're never stuck there. And he gives us the power we need to resist the temptation. Well, uh, we just wanted to reach out real quick and say a Merry Christmas to everybody. We've got, Merry our, Christmas. We've got our fancy little background here. Uh, just to bring a little bit of holiday spirit to you guys. I mean, Andrew, would you like to say anything for this Christmas? Man, I hope that you feel God's presence as never before. Um, no question that 2020 is a different year. 2020 will be a different Christmas. But I hope as you um, experience that different Christmas, that it will draw you closer to God, that you will be able to see as never before what's truly important, and that you would um, not only by faith know that God is with you, but that you would have an awareness of his presence, of his power, of his love, that Christmas could truly be celebrated in your heart um, because of the way that you worship God. And I just hope that people this year can maybe focus on something different with the Christmas story. Hmm. I mean, I feel like I've heard the Christmas story enough times, but every time you come back to it, you may notice something different. Hmm. So I'm just saying maybe have an open mind about the Christmas story this year. Maybe have an open mind to look at, okay, he says he's to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. I mean, just, just some of the smaller details that could really make a difference in the whole story. God's Word is new and fresh every morning. And, and, and our situation is different, so when we come to God's Word, um, He will speak to us. But you know, there's an amazing passage in Matthew 25 where um, it's Judgment Day. And um, everyone's there who's ever lived, and um, all the angels are there. So it's a massive group, and the king, who is Jesus himself, divides the people like a shepherd would divide sheep from goats, and mm -hmm. he places some on their right and some on their left. Mm -hmm. And you remember to those on his right, he says, if I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. So it's an incredible passage. And of course, those people don't remember mm -hmm. feeding Jesus or giving something to drink because it's a normal part of their lives to take care of people and to help people and to be concerned for the needs of others. And so they don't, they don't really remember that. And Jesus will then say, when you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. And that passage presents a beautiful picture of the presence of Christ, how Christ is really present in an, an incredible way. 
because when we serve the least of these, Christ is present in us as we serve. Christ is present in the least of these Mm -hmm. because he has identified himself with the least of these. And so you have a beautiful picture there of the presence of Christ um, everywhere you look. So that's an amazing thing, too, that gets revealed in that scene of judgment. Um, But it's a powerful affirmation um, of God's presence and the reality that God is with us as we serve and in the people whom we serve. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus said, Behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. Yes, sir. Hey, Deep Dive for Life listeners. I just wanted to reach out and say Merry Christmas from all of us here at Deep Dive for Life. We hope you all have a safe and happy holiday, and we'll be back next week for New Year's. So we'll see you then. Thanks a lot, and Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas.